Thank you for coming and good evening everyone. Je m'appelle Marek. That's I think all I can say French and maybe with bad pronunciation. Uh, in any case, I'm a software engineer uh, working for Oracle and uh, currently I'm a spec lead for Jaxares, which is a uh, Java RESTful API. Uh, and uh, I've been working with web services for over six years now, or with developing web services frameworks for over six years now, and uh, in developing in general for Java e for over 10 years already. Which is something I counted, counted today on the plane. I was surprised myself how long I have been doing this. So this is a standard Oracle disclaimer for those who attended any presentation. It basically says that whatever I'm going to tell you, you should not believe me, or at least you should not base any business, you should not make any business decisions based on uh, what I'm going to tell you because this is a future, future statement that I'm going to make. So, uh, let me ask you one question. How many of you know REST? Can you raise your hands? Okay. And uh, keep your hands up. And how many of you want to tell me the definition of the REST? <laughs> I thought so. So, very short REST primer for those of you who didn't raise hands. Um, the, the, the REST is an architectural st style in which you basically work with nouns and you name the nouns, you assign them some ID and uh, typically you link the, these components which are named together by some hyperlinks and uh, the major difference to the, to the RPC calls is that you use only a limited set of well-defined methods so you basically, typically for, for REST, uh, HTTP is, is the most commonly known <coughs> Uh, set of methods that, that you can use and they are they have a common meaning that is the same for all the resources uh, also these uh, resources or nouns or components whatever you call it are um, can be represented in multiple ways they, they doesn't necessarily mean need to be only XMLs or text data or, or videos they just represent some concept behind behind the the, the resources are the concept behind the representation that can be provided to the to the end user. And uh, last but not least, stateless communication is something that is RESTful, or the RESTful architecture relies on the stateless communication, which doesn't mean that the REST uh, the resource uh, doesn't have cannot have a state. It just means that the client when when the client communicates with the resource, the communication needs to be stateless. There is no session going on or something like that. Cookies are bad in REST, even though we support them in JaxRS. So JaxRS is the API for developing the RESTful web services. Um, it was uh, initially proposed by Paul Sandals and Mark Hadley back in, I think, 2006 or maybe even sooner, uh, and, uh, or 2005. And uh, the main goal was to make a POJO-based API, which would uh, which would be uh, focused on the server side because we were solving the the restful story for Java E, so the natural focus was, was on the server side. The API took the HTTP inter, uh, interface as the, as the one that uh, it will focus on, so it will provide more HTTP-centric way of of working with REST. And by the way. 99% of RESTful applications are written in, in, in uh, HTTP, so it, it made a lot of sense. Also, the, 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 the main focus was uh, to not be dependent on any kind of format, so not to bind the format of the, of the representation to the resource and uh, how, how the things are marshaled and unmarshaled, uh, as well as uh, the, uh, the, the, the ultimate goal was to include it in the, in the Java E. So, uh, I, when I did this presentation at DevOps, I, I had like a lot of slides. Some people found it boring, so I decided to uh, do something else here. Instead of the lot of slides showing the code, let me just show you the uh, JaxRS 1.1 API, how it currently looks like, what, what is the final thing. Is anyone using this API already, or is it, is it going to be useful, by the way? So, should I, should I do it? 
<laughs> okay, so 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 let me switch uh, to my uh, to my ID. Can you see? Can you see? Should I make it bigger? Yes. A little bit bigger.
Uh, I'm using a, I'm, I'm using a jersey. Uh, sorry, I'm using, a, uh, I'm using jersey as the as the uh, jump start is runtime, and uh, I'm running it on, on top of the Grizzly server. So never mind this code too much. I'm just basically going to st start the start the application. So the application has been started. I'm not sure if I can make this bigger. No, unfortunately, I can't. So basically, for those who cannot read it, it just said that the, the, the resource was deployed at the local host 80 port 8080 slash chat. So let me uh, just uh, let me just open the browser and. Uh, Open the browser here and let me type. Uh, I'm sorry for my for my mistypings. I have this laptop only like for a week, and uh, and the Apple key mappings are not completely. Uh, Apple keyboard is not completely familiar, familiar to me. So I send the get. Down there, for those who cannot read it, it says that it received the get message. I didn't, I didn't provide the ID, so it, uh, it, uh, it serialized to not now. And uh, basically, since it's a blocking queue, the get is still waiting for, for, for a response from a server. So I'm blocked basically on the server. So let, let me, let me try to from here use a, uh, use a. Use curl and uh, send uh, some hi there message back to the uh, back to the uh, to the server. Post it in, in a post place. So I'm going to post the message. The message was posted. I received that the message was stored, and suddenly th this message appeared in, in the uh, in the in the web browser as well. So our resources are. It, this is just a demonstration that our resource are, is really is really running and, and working as, as expected. Let's now maybe come, go back to the or resume the presentation. Okay, so that was the that was the server side API for creating resources, which is one to one. Uh, but over time, basically, people. People came up with ideas how, how this API could be extended, and, and several new features came into mind. So first and foremost, the client API. There's, there was no client API in in, in Jaxar as one of those. Then uh, the next one is filters or handlers, or as we call them now, interceptors. The that would let you intercept the request flow. Uh, or the, serial, the, the serialization and deserialization of the entities. The next one is validation. Also, another one uh, is uh, asynchronous processing on the server, especially on the server side, so that we don't have this blocking uh, on, the, on the server when, when we have such blocking operations like we just saw. The hypermedia or Hyperlinking, uh, better support for hyperlinking is also one of the areas where people wanted wanted us to improve the API, uh, as well as the server side content negotiation, uh, JSR three three O integration, and support for MVC. So those were the main areas where when uh, the, the when we started thinking about the Jaxar Studio as the next major up update to the API, and. Uh, the EG was formed in uh, February last year, so it's been working for over a year now. And uh, after some turmoils, the, it's, uh, the, the leads were settled to myself and a colleague of mine, Santiago, uh, who is working from Florida. And we have an expert group uh, members from uh, Red Hat, uh, eBay, o o o Talent, and OW. So the talent, the Sergey from Talent is working on CXL implementation, and uh, also some other individual contributors who were part of the original stack as well. Oh, so the the last thing is that currently we published the second early draft uh, about a month ago, and we plan to publish the next early draft in the, in the next month. So 
if you watch uh, the project the link that we provided in the end of the presentation, you can you can see what's the current status of the of the project. Uh, we should be final about uh, uh, in, in the third quarter of this year, uh, to, to completely with the spec together with the with the RI. Okay, so what what will be the new from all those areas that we mentioned? Yeah, the client API, it will be there, filters and interceptors as well. We are going to provide support for integration with validation, asynchronous processing, we are going to also show it a little bit today. The hypermedia support is somewhat improved, even though Stefan is still pushing me to do something over there. And uh, server-side content negotiation, yes. JSR uh, 3.0 is somewhat questionable. We initially thought like it's an old brainer, we are going to do that, but uh, now it's uh, there are some issues with it. Uh, so we will see, I'm, I'm going to explain later. And what's not, not going to be there is definitely the MVC, at least not for, for So when I say MVC is not going to be part of the spec, it doesn't mean that, uh, doesn't mean that the implementations are not going to provide some, uh, some proprietary way how to how to extend the, the API to support NVC and plug the, the views, but uh, uh, right now the expert group felt like you don't have enough uh, critical mass and, and enough experience to uh, to standardize up on a common solution that would work for everyone, everybody. Okay, so now let's uh, start with the client API, which is, I guess, the largest addition and most of the time. Uh, the problem with the current uh, HTTP libraries for, uh, for and using them for the rest of the uh, purposes are that they are too low level for us. And uh, basically, we also wanted to have this nice kind of the uh, decoupling of the entity serialization and deserialization from from, uh, from actual um, from actual entity representation in Java. So we wanted to reuse the message body readers and writers from JSRS 1.x. And uh, last, last but not least, obviously every major implementation of JSRS 1.x is currently already providing some kind of a client API. So if everybody is providing it and people, people need it, why don't, why don't we just uh, standardize up on it together? So the client API, just very conceptually, Obviously, you start with the client factory if you want to, if you want to work with the JavaScript to the client API. You create a client. You can configure it via some configuration object. Then you can derive the resources from the client. The client is supposed to be something of a heavyweight object that is only existing only in like one or two copies in your application. And the resources are more lightweight. They, they just represent the link to the actual resource, so that's why I call it target. target. Um, then, again, you can update the configuration. The, the, thing is, the thing here is that each derived resource from the client or from another parent resource inherits the configuration and shares it with the, with the parent. But as soon as you update the configuration, it kind of magically creates a copy for itself and, uh, and under the hood and uh, uh, the, the custom configuration will be then only custom for this particular uh, component, not, it will not be propagated to the parent. So that's how we can achieve the isolation between what is your global configuration for the whole application, what are the providers you want to register globally, and what are the specific properties and providers you want to register just for the, just for the single uh, particular resource, let's say, the ATM. Okay, so once you have the resource, you get the request builder. Uh, again, you can still configure the, the on the level of the particular request, and you either directly invoke it to get a response, or you can create an invocation and then uh, then invoke and get the get the response from the invocation. The invocation is uh, providing you the uh, kind of uniform or generic interface. It's better name. The, it's a command pattern, so to say. So it has the get and submit operations so for one for synchronous and one for asynchronous cases. And uh, with these uh, common operations, you just you just can prepare multiple requests and then send them in one single batch. 
and that was one of the requirements that came when we were designing the API. Let's now have a look again back uh, at the API, uh, sorry, at the code. Um, and uh, I'm, going to, I'm, I'm going to write the, write the client for the resource that we have just created uh, in, in, in the previous example. So here I have the client, I just need to instantiate it. So uh, the, the way you do it is to uh, to, to, to use the client factory. And you can either pass the configuration or just call the new client. And then uh, to get the uh, chat resource target, uh, you, can, uh, you can use the client. And uh, select one of the target methods. And uh, just for the demonstration purposes, I'm going to um, uh, derive another target from it. So the, the actual chat will be a derived target from the parent target that just targets the local host. Uh, uh, root path. Okay, so now that we have a chat target, let's post a message there. I'm going to tell him what uh, what kind of uh, media uh, media types I support. I, I accept for the for the response, and then just uh, I'm going to post the MTP. The entity is, uh, I, have, I can have a static helper and I'm going to say that it's going to be text. And I'm going to send there some very message. All right, so I just posted the request. I print out that the, that the, that the message was posted. Uh, then I'm going to wait for the enter and then let's retrieve the message. So, uh, again, I'm going to just uh, hold the request, tell, the, tell, tell him that I want to receive text plane, which is what, what, what he supports anyway, and just hold it. Get and I also going to tell him that I want to that I want to receive the response as a string. So now basically this is the usage of the new client API. It's completely restful. There's no Jersey code in it. And let's try to run it. So that would be the that would be briefly the client API. And let's now move on to filters and interceptors. Frankly, uh, I wanted to show some example on this, but we are. This is the most uh, the most discussed 
think currently and probably it will be something that we are going to uh, update uh, very soon. So I'm just going to provide you what are the high level concepts we are we are looking at behind behind the filters and interceptors. I'm not going to show too much code for those. Uh, so basically, obviously the filters and interceptors are here to intercept something. We dis distinguish between uh, between the two filters are for intercepting the the request and the response flow. The interceptors are something that intercept the int entity serialization and deserialization, which means that they don't have to be called if the application layer doesn't want to, to read the response at all, for instance. So they are useful for different types of stuff. And uh, uh, the initial idea was that they will be shared by the client and the server, so they still are in the current version of the API. But I have a hunch that it will not remain the same for, 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 for any longer. Because we found out that then we, we face a problem of identifying what filters, if you have an application that using the filter, the, the server and the client side of the logic, and you have some dedicated filters for, for the client and some dedicated for the server, then what would you do to distinguish between the two? And uh, this is something for which the annotation is not completely the right thing because of the API is a little bit low level. Um, People tend to forget to add the annotations and then they kind of face the very weird behavior of the whole system just because some server side filter was applied on the client side. So, also, again, the frameworks that, that are out there already support the filter somehow. Um, first, the supports only filters but lets you grab the entity input streams and output streams so that you can. Uh, kind of uh, from a filter create a uh, way of interceptor in REST easy. Uh, as far as I know, they support both uh, like a separate, a separate, uh, separate components or separate uh, API concepts. Uh, so as you can see, even though those two major implementations use slightly uh, different semantics for for filters and, and how to work with them. So it makes definitely sense to, to standardize some kind of common API. Um, filters, as I said, they are they are uh, intercepting the request or response uh, processing on the either on the server or on the, on the client side, and uh, they are um, non-wrapping, which means that when the risk, re the request first goes through the filter chain, then it's processed by the application, but not from within the call of the filter. It's not like a wrapping that. Would that would one filter call another one until you get all of them and then when, when the request is, is processed, everything, all the calls that would return back. So that's not the case. These are not wrapping, these are just doing what they need to do and then pass the control to the next filter in the chain. Similarly, the response filter is the same for the response. Uh, there is a, so, a specialty on the server side, we need to weigh how to distinguish between the filters that need to be run before we do the request matching. Uh, request matching is uh, what we do with every request. Whenever we get a request, we take the request URI and try to find the resource that it matches. So some filters need to be run before that and don't have the, don't need the information about the resource that is being involved. Some other filters need to be run once, the, once we found the right resource and uh, need the information about the resource that is being involved. So that's why the, distinct, the, the distinction between the two. As for interceptors, they are wrapping, unlike filters. And they are, as I said earlier, for the intercepting the serialization and deserialization of entity, which again means that uh, sometimes if, if the application layer is not interested in, 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 in reading the entity or writing it, the filters will not be, sorry, the interceptors will not be involved. Uh, those are common and they most likely remain common for the both client and server side because of the use cases that we see uh, as suitable for, for, for the interceptors and those use cases are common for both sides. So in order to, to use filters and interceptors you somehow need to identify to which resources they, they should apply. So you can either have, a, either have a global binding for the filter which means they are supposed to be applied to everything, 
or they, uh, they need to somehow be identified that only they apply to only some particular resources in, in, the, um, in the application. And again, for both of these cases, you can uh, have a use case where you let the, let the filter decide whether uh, it, can, it should be applied or not by the runtime, and that can be implemented by the dynamic binding interface. The global binding is the default, and for the name binding, we, we introduce the name binding annotation, which will be explained uh, in, in shortly. Uh, we are also thinking, as part of the poss possible integration with the JSR 3.0, to reuse the add qualifier. So, I don't know, does does it make sense so far? Yes, no, maybe. If, if you were to tell me what would you choose, create a new annotation for the binding, or would you, would you want me to pick the existing from the JSR 3.3.0, even though if we don't provide the full JSR 3.3.0 support? Any comments on that? It's a hard decision, but after the, <laughs> after the, after the, after the, it's you can come to me and tell me what you think about this. So this name binding basically, uh, similarly to what qualifier does, actually, JSR 3.3.0 is the meta annotation that let you uh, create a named annotation that you will use to kind of bind the filter and the resource. So uh, here, here I'm creating the locked uh, binding annotation. And uh, on the next slide, I'm sorry, it's on this slide, but uh, on the bottom, <coughs> I'm basically uh, naming the logging filter or binding it with this locked annotation. So far to nothing, just, I'm just saying that this is the logging filter which is identified by the log annotation and I'm assigning it some priority. So we also have logging filter priorities which we use for all the, all the ordering the filters in the filter chain because the, the registration is, uh, as you can see, dynamic and, and discovered. We don't have like an absolute, uh, absolute ordering in the filter chain. That's why we need uh, uh, some, some way how to pass the priority of the, of the filters. So once we have the filter named and the naming annotation defined, we can basically just use the annotation on, on either a method or a resource or whatever. And uh, this basically completes the binding between the filter and the, and the method it should be applied. So in this case, it's obvious that uh, this resource filter, whenever the method hello is invoked, it should be placed by the runtime into the chain involved before the actual hello method is involved by the application. So that it <clears throat> Similarly, if it was a response filter, then uh, after the, this method finishes and provides the response, the response filter would need to be called based on this annotation. Okay, so that would be it for the filters and interceptors. Let's move to the next area, which is validation. Um, basically, everybody who is doing any server-side uh, work needs to validate data, uh, especially when they when they come in. And uh, it's not like something specific to REST. So we certainly didn't want to didn't want to introduce a new new thing for doing bin, doing bin validation or data validation in REST. And we said, geez, there are, there, are, there are some guys in Red Hat who are working on the bin validation specification, and there is uh, something out there already for Java E6, so why don't we just reuse it? So that's how we came to the idea to just bring in the um, integration with the bin validation uh, API and, and provide this uh, functionality in the JAX RS. Um, just briefly about the bin validation API, so what I'm going to show is not part of the JAX RS API, it's just the how the, well, the, the important pieces that I'm going to show are not from the JAXRS API this time, they are from the validation API. They are, they are annotation based, and uh, basically here you can see some new validation annotations. So I'm just trying to validate here that the first and last name are not new, and then I'm using some custom uh, validation for validating the email format, which I need, for which I need to provide the, the 
my own, uh, and I need to write my own constraint validator because uh, uh, so far the validation of API doesn't provide the built-in email validator. So how do I do that? I first need the email uh, annotation that I just used previously, so which must, must be annotated with add constraint annotation that uh, specifies the name of the validator class being used for the validation of this annotation and then I need to uh, implement the email validator that, that basically implements the constant validator for the annotation and some particular type can be for any type. Uh, and the, the, the important is that is the is valid method which implements the actual validation. This works the way that whenever the bin validation framework sees the email annotation on, on some field or or method or getter method or uh, or bin, then it uh, basically uh, and, and the right moment comes for the validation. It basically invokes this validator to to validate the, the particular component or part of the part of the data that you are that was annotated. Also, uh, the as I said. It, you, you don't only uh, you don't only need to place the, uh, the validation annotation on, on fields or uh, methods or, or the method parameters. You can also put them on the class but to validate the whole bin. So not only just the single pieces, but maybe even like if these two fields, their values, even if th these values are correct, do they make sense if they are there together? So those types of validations can be put on the class. But then in the JAXRS, interesting thing happens because sometimes you don't want to do the validation even if the, uh, even if the pin is valid, validated, but you still want to use the pin. So what do we do? So we decided that we will reuse another annotation which is called add valid, and that we will do only the validation of the input, of the resource input in, in those cases when the add valid is, uh, annotation is also valid. This applies to the Particularly to the to the parameters and uh, to the to the fields of the resource class that are injected by JAXRS. Uh, additionally, you can also not only use the validation which which are uh, which are defined on the on the on the class itself. You can add additional validations also and do the dual validations. So you will validate for A as well as for B as the second method shows. So that's briefly about the validation. Moving to the async processing, I still have like 15 minutes, right? Uh, is, there, is there a real hard stop? Sorry, what? Is there a hard stop at, at half completely? You, you know why it stops. Uh, okay. okay, so uh, quickly about async processing. Um, we provide async processing also in the client, uh, on both client and the server API. So we have the, uh, what you saw on the client API, we have the synchronous interfaces. Uh, similarly to those, you can get the asynchronous interfaces where you can either get a future or just pass the callback, which will get involved once the response, once the response is available. Um, I'm not going to show you today because uh, I don't have a full confidence in the current implementation yet. I need to test it a little bit more uh, on, the, on the client side. But the server side is something that we released in Jersey Milestone 2 uh, this week, actually, So and, and it's working. I, 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 had some, I had some issue there, and uh, um, which was hard to debug. I liked it. When I ran the test, it, it only happened once or twice a day. So it was really, really difficult to find, but then we solved it, and, and I ran the test for like five consecutive days in the, in the loop, the same test, just to see if the bug occurs and never appeared, so I'm quite confident there already now. So on the server side, basically, why, why, why would we need async? As you can see, you have the either long-running operations or, or operations that are waiting for, for async event. And for those cases, you basically don't want to block the container resources. You probably want to offload it to some other thread pool and let, let the dedicated thread will deal with the long running operation and only once the operation is finished and the response is available you just uh, resume or tell the container to take the response back so you first suspend so what you typically do is first suspend the connection 
which only tells the container to not close it automatically when the container thread ex exits, and then uh, you resume the response uh, at some arbitrary async event time. Um, and also for for the for the drug service, we want to leverage the server to x uh, async API that is already in Java E and uh, uh, we, so so the API is kind of uh, tries to tries to not be too different from from, from the server three X API so that we can uh, nicely reuse it. <coughs> Once again, switch back to the NetBeans and look at some code. So this chat resource that we created is something that is really really uh, looks for oh, sorry. Something that, that really looks for uh, making it asynchronous. Uh, and uh, for, for the purpose of this demo, I'm going to show you what, what happens if it's not asynchronous. So I'm, I have a limited uh, number of threads in the Grizzly container, which uh, will only can uh, take certain number of, of, of requests. And once the, uh, once the thread will get saturated, it will basically you will see the DOS actually in denial of service attack because uh, the other if the if the requests are still in the queue the other requests cannot come in. So uh, I have a I have a main class here which basically uh, creates an executor and spawns uh, 50, uh, 50 new threads with the fifty get requests. Just to saturate the, just to saturate the, uh, the, the server, and uh, let us uh, let us have a look also here. So let me bring this up. So here I have some methods which are which which were uh, satisfied. Let me now run the let me now run this client. So he's running. He's, he executed all the 50 threads, but uh, as you will be able to see in a moment, only like few of them. So this is not this is not complete. So only like a dozen of them were really received on the server and in the in the resource application. And now whatever I do, no other no all the other requests are blocked. They cannot just enter. So this is the, exactly the case where I should think asynchronously as it's a chat application, there is some async event going on. I don't know when, when, the, post, when the next post comes. So uh, let's make it, let's, let's uh, kill this push server and uh, we did the client. And uh, let's make the chat resource asynchronous. So to make the chat resource asynchronous, you, as I said, you need to suspend and then resume. First thing you need to do is to inject execution context, which is the new API in Jaxars to the context. So once once I inject the context, I can I can basically use it for either programmatic suspending or resume or resuming the but. Right now, I'm not going to use it for suspending because I want to show you that uh, for 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 easy suspending, you can use the at suspend annotation, which basically, as the first thing, when you, when the method is entered, it, it tells the containers to suspend the request, and uh, then whatever is executed in the method is uh, is basically required to use the context to resume. The, the suspended request with the response. This context gets injected for each request and as such can be used for resuming a single particular request that was suspended. So um, let's modify this a little bit. And instead of return, I can leave it here, but normally I would just remove the message and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, 
uh, return void because of the suspended request uh, for, for the suspended uh, operation, all the responses written from the method are uh, from the method. Uh, these responses are ignored, and then I'm just going to resume the uh, resume the request once once the message is available with the message. Similarly for, for post, because it's also potentially blocking operation. I'm going to suspend it. And instead of returning a message store, I'm going to I'm going to resume with the with the, with the same message. So maybe I can really just uh, delete this and uh, just just for this second method to avoid so that you believe me it's really uh, it's really using the, the, the rest of the return from the from the region. Uh, this is not it because so far I didn't do anything to offload it from the container thread. So one way how, how, how to do it is to, for instance, in, in, in Java in container you can impl either implement asynchronous EJB and it will automatically spawn a thread for you before you uh, before you uh, before before it invokes a method uh, from from some thread to the thread pool. Uh, the other one, the other way would be to do the similar thing I did on the client side, create the executor and basically spawn a, a run run the async logic in, in, the, uh, in the other thread uh, from the executor. Uh, what I'm actually going to do is to keep it this way and pretend it's like an EJP for the simplicity. But I'm going to use a custom jersey feature which lets you plug in your own processing executor. So I have a, I have a custom module that takes in a uh, executor provider and this executor provider provides the executor for the request and response process. So this one we can have a look for at the implementation. Uh, let me just make it a little bit bigger. This one basically returns a new uh, cache thread pool for the request processing and returns now for the response for the response processing part which, which indicates that the it should happen on the same thread as the request. But this is what I'm showing to you is, is a jersey proprietary feature. It's not going to go into the API. Uh, but it's useful. <laughs> so um, now that I did the changes, I made the resource asynchronous and I uh, plugged in my custom uh, uh, request executor provider. Let's uh, save the application and try to restart the server. Right, since the, the server has started, and now, now let's try to run the same, same, uh, uh, same client test with the, with the 50 clients there. So as you as you could see previously, only like a dozen of clients got got in. So now everybody should get in because we are asynchronous and we are offloading the the processing of the resource to to, to some arbitrary thread provided by the asynchronous executor provider. I'll let, let me run it and oh, I'm running different stuff, sorry. Oh, by the way, so let, <laughs> since, since I run that, um, let me get back to the client API actually. So uh, this is what I was talking about, the inheritance. Uh, Basically, I'm creating a client, I'm setting some property on it, then I'm creating a target, setting another property, another target, uh, setting another property, and uh, another request builder setting a property, well, overriding the property set on the client. And if I, if I run this test after everything has done and output the configuration of all the, of all the uh, client side, the output looks like this. Where you can see that the client has only one property, the root target has inherited from the client and has its own, then the chat target inherits from both and has an additional one, 
and then the request builder basically inherits from everybody but overrides from what was said on the client. So now that I run it and I skipped it previously, I just reduce the mistake. So let's now really run the what we wanted to run. And in the chat server, as you can see, basically all of the all of the requests got in. Not important. And all of the, all of the requests are now waiting for the response. So it's not like we are, we are facing the DOS. We can really we can really send send them some response. The response is there. Basically, once I would send all the 50 responses, the, the client uh, the client application would stop. So let me instead just just kill it. Okay, so uh, back to the presentation. I have two minutes. Perfect. Uh, Hypermedia. I can avoid it. <laughs> uh, basically, uh, no, I don't want to avoid it. The, it's one of the QRS principles to identify everything with names, and it's a shame that the Jax as one of the API didn't provide basically any any facility for, for supporting links. Uh, currently, we consider supporting two types of link. Ones are transitionals, which provide you a, a view of a resource and tell you what are the possible next states you can get in, like you have the order, you can get to the ship address for the order, or something like that. Uh, the other are stru uh, structure links, and the, these are basically providing the links from these resource to some more fe fi fine grain information about the resource or some related information about the resource. Basically, the ones on the top are transitional links, which tell you how to ship or cancel the order. The other ones are structure links, which provide you more information about the order provide information on the customer address and stuff. So initially we wanted to support only the first, uh, the transitional links, then we decided to do something also for the structure links, but uh, since it's quite a hard problem and I cannot go into details uh, because of uh, I don't have time, uh, we just decided that the, the structure links will be supported uh, manually so that when you have when you inject them in the model we provide you the types that you can use currently without you having to create new types for them. Um, so uh, those are just the examples just, uh, just skip that and let's uh, continue with the uh, rest of the presentation so there are some other topics that we are doing first quite interesting thing that wasn't solved in the Jaxers one of the is the uh, server-side content negotiation. What does it mean? So let's assume the client sends you get and it tells you that it accepts any text and the quality for, for any text doesn't matter to me. It's all the same. And on the server you can produce text plain and text HTML. So which one do you serve then? So typically the Jaxers one of the implementations either provided the some proprietary extension that lets you define this, which is the, which is what we call server-side content negotiation, to let the server decide which which uh, which is the preferred content type it should serve if the client doesn't care. Obviously, if the client would care and it would say, "I want text HTML," the server would not dare to pick anything else if it can provide text HTML. So um, the solution is to on the server side to assign the quality, server side quality indicators for each media type. And based on these, you can say that uh, for this case, if the client doesn't care, just give, give, give back the text HTML. And this actually, this, this is a kind of a thing that happens often, because often people provide text, H, both, both versions, HTML <coughs> or XML and text play. And if you intend your data to be displayed in the browser, the browser will typically sends you, uh, basically all the browsers send you that they support all the types and they don't care which one you send. So 
basically, typically, even if you could, could explain the, the HTML page, what happened is that you send back just the text play data. So that's that's where the uh, that's where the server side content negotiation become, becomes handy because as a developer you can decide. So this is my preferred way. If you can accept it, just just use this one. JSR 3.0 integration, as I said. Um, there are big questions around it, especially um, when it comes to how much should we support it. There are, there are similarities like uh, the qualifier and the name, and the name binding annotation, uh, the provider in the JSR 3.3.0 and the context resolver which exists already in the JSR 1.1. Uh, but there are big issues. And the issue is that the, the, same, the same annotation, the, in particular the app inject, is reduced by the CDI container and you are facing the chicken egg problem because right now when you want to interact with CDI you let the CDI inject stuff and, and give you the resource and then you inject on top of it the JAXRS part so now you would need to somehow overcome this and plug in under the CDI and, and well, do some tricks for which we are not sure it's a it's, we are ready for, for putting something into the specification directly. Sure, we want to do something in the, uh, in the implementation, or in, at least for, for the Jersey, I can speak. We want to do something in the, in the implementation in some proprietary solution, but for now we don't uh, feel like it's, uh, uh, it's worth uh, pushing for the standardization. And the uh, next thing is that whenever I talk to the EG members, they don't see too much of a value for adding. So if you feel otherwise, just go to the mailing list and, and send, the, send the emails at the users uh, at jsrstack.jawanet and tell them that they are wrong, that you really, really want it. Maybe you won't hear. Uh, as for other topics, uh, we are also thinking uh, improving the server security support, so like supporting uh, integration with the standard Java EE annotations for security and also out at terminal and at denial, which is currently not directly supported on the resources but could be. Um, pluggable views, this is the MVC that, that is not going to happen in, uh, in, in the 2 time frame and we are reserving it for the next next major release uh, as well as the high, uh, high level client API simply because we couldn't find a uh, uh, unified view on what the RESTful high, high client API should look like. Whenever we start with something, it typically ends up looking like a salt. And that's uh, something we really, really, really want to avoid. OK, so I guess uh, that's it from me. Thank you very much for <laughs> Any questions, anyone? I can take maybe couple of them here and then I will be able to do outside. You were a bit fast on the Hypermedia slide. Can we just uh, see uh, the slide where you show how you can implement uh, you add links? Oh, I, I'm not sure if I have it on the slide. So basically what I'm, what I'm showing you is that you can, you can create a link using a link builder. And uh, then you can use the response, which is already in the in the JAXRS 1.1. Only a couple of methods were added there to actually attach the links to the, to the response. And you can either attach directly without building it, or you can just, if you have, a, have it pre-built, it comes maybe in a, in, a, in a request, which is kind of weird. Uh, but whatever, if you, if you have it pre-built, uh, you, can, you, can, you can send them in response. So we initially started with some uh, better support with some annotation based approach for providing uh, injectable um, header links into, into every request but uh, then it boiled down to this because this is a basis for it and uh, as with other stuff like our philosophy is not to not to standardize anything that we may regret in the future. Like once you put something into the API, uh, which is part of the Java E, basically like you can never never remove it. 
in JAXA, as we already have pro big problems with how the current request API looks like. We wanted to, to extend it. We, we got some, we got somewhere, and uh, we got some exception from the rule, and just because of the nature of this request API. But it's very very hard to do any, any changes once you put it there. So that's why we, we chose to provide at least this, but. Uh, Better not to go somewhere further where we might uh, later regret. And then the next uh, code I had on it was uh, how to get the link from on the client side from the uh, from the response and how to create another target uh, client target from from the link directly without uh, needing to re repeat the information. Just the basically everything is about the convenience here. What I don't show here is that there are some there are some types which I mentioned oh, sorry, which I mentioned here. Uh, the link has uh, subtypes, the static classes, the JAXB adapter and JAXB link. And the JAXB adapter is something that you can put into the JAXB XML attribute uh, adapter annotation. Or I, I can't recall exactly the name of the annotation, but if you put it there, it will. And, and you will have the link just as an interface or link as a class in, in the in, in your model. It will automatically know that it should uh, marshal it as a JAXB as a JAXB link, which as a JAXB, which is a JAXB pin with all the annotation also unmarshaled from the JAXB pin. So that's how you can basically use the links also uh, on on the on the JAXB models. So I'm sorry, I don't have the code for that. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Good. Any other questions? Okay. So thank you again, and uh, enjoy the evening. And if you want to ask me, I'll be. Here.